us at CalArts. My name's Amanda Beach. I'm the Dean of the School of Critical Studies up at CalArts. Um, and I'm chairing these three talks. Uh, this is the second talk night. We have the third talk, which is April the 10th, I think, with Rachel Garfield, just to let you know about that one in the future. Um, and this series uh, is called Structures of Dissonance, Aesthetics Beyond Capital, question mark. Very important uh, bit to put on the end there. And I'm just gonna talk a tiny little bit about the theme um, before introducing our amazing speaker tonight. So the political claim of contemporary art, specifically since the mid 20th century avant-garde has often been hinged upon a politics of resistance, antagonism and difference. In such case, a, polit a political art does not structure power, but rather unstructures it in creative forms of destabilizations. Often this form of art has been identified in a, as an aesthetic experience where the experience of sensory phenomena is seen to resist the top-down ordering and instrumental functions of rational languages and aesthetics. This type of experience is often being claimed to make art akin to an indifferent kind of nature that withdraws from and troubles any form of organizational power. And yet we can see how capital, uh, the capital we live with in every day, produces its own form of dissonance and its own naturalisms Unstable environments of high frequency exchange and unregulated markets bring us to this delirious, alienating and dissonant experience of living in and as capital. It divides us, estranges us from ourselves and each other proliferating difference under the principle of accumulation. And we know that these affects, whether they are seen in art or capital, no matter how apparently chaotic, rely upon produce and calcify structures. Here we could say that despite art's critical work, it risks underwriting the unbearable social inequalities of race, gender, and class that have been authored by capital. This all together leaves us wondering what symptom, systems, orders, and principles are relied upon and constructed in art's claim to aesthetic resistance today. What forms of dissonance in art is art inhabiting now, if any? Is dissonance a useful topic for art today at all? And if art requires structures, rules in order to achieve dissonance, what are those exactly? And I'm just really pleased and amazed that um, we have Luciana Parisi here tonight um, because I've been trying to get her to come over to the West Coast for quite a while and COVID was really difficult for us. So we did some online work, but you're here in person. So I just want to thank you so much for being with us tonight, Luciana. Luciana's Parisi's research lays at the intersections of continental philosophy, information sciences, digital, digital media, computational technologies. Her publications address the techno-capitalist investment in artificial intelligence, biotechnology, nanotechnology, uh, and others to express challenges to con conceptions of gender, race, and class. And she's also written extensively within the fields of media philosophy and computational design in order to investigate metaphysical possibilities of instrumentality. Her CV is absolutely extensive, and I know that you've got a copy of um, uh, her um, biography in front of you, so I won't um, labor the point. But again, I just want to welcome Luciana um, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming on a terrible rainy night, which I can't believe it's still raining here <laughs> with the kind of film noir rain that we keep getting these days. Um, and I hope you enjoy the talk. We'll have hopefully plenty of time afterwards for questions. So whether you're remote out there in uh, wherever you are and you're watching on YouTube or you're here in person, I hope that we can have a really open and um, possibly productive discussion after Luciana. So thank you. Thank Welcome. You. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda, and uh, thank you, everyone, very much to everyone who's made this possible today um, for organizing my flights, my hotel, and for being here at the ICA. I'm very thrilled to be here. Um, I hope this works fine. So, um, yes, I'm going to start just um, uh, reading some of my work that um, I've been um, producing and writing thinking recently. So 
I appreciate you being here. Hopefully this can be um, a generous discussion. As OpenAI launched DALI E, concepts in natural language are directly transformed into images. AI generated images are said not only to show us that AI understands human words, but also to stretch the aesthetic dimension of vision. However, I suggest algorithmic instrumentality beg us to question of what counts as aesthetics in the aftermath of computational thinking. To approach the relation between instrumentality and aesthetics or between AI and art more generally, one must ask, can algorithms meet the creative ambition of aesthetic production without simply intensifying the recursive trends of cognitive capital? Can machine aesthetic act as a collider and accelerating non-instrumental instrumentality, running away from the cosmogamy of men, the colonial and patriarchal onto-epistemology that grant authority to capital. The paradox of aesthetic and capital, which sustains the freedom of so-called homo bioeconomicus, as Sylvia Winter calls him, through the algorithmic function of the slave machine, is designed um, uh, by what Francois Laruel calls the decisional structure of philosophy. So to unpack the paradox of aesthetic and capital, I want to suggest today, one must um, attend to the question of instrumentality and thus reopen the critique of instrumental reasoning through which philosophy has set up AI as a mirroring of its priority. This impasse, I argue, precludes critical thinking um, from questioning um, technology beyond the Promethean mission of salvaging men. Since instrumentality turns the limit of, of reason into the exteriority of the machine, I also argue that AI envisions what I called um, an alien hypothesis, a xenopatterning for the unknown, for which capital confront incompleteness in the abstraction extraction of the negative slave machine value. So my talk today draws on some of my uh, recent work on the critique of instrumentality, through which I question the subsumption of technology and generative AI to cognitive and creative capital. But to question this assumption, I argue, is also to challenge the onto-epistemological structure of capital, for which the duality of philosophy or reason and aesthetics or the being of the sensible ultimately results from the authority of self-determining decision. I will explain more what I mean by this. To address what aesthetic is in the aftermath of computation, I suggest, one must decouple instrumentality from the decisional structure of philosophy, for which technology only remains a medium for ontoepistemology, i.e. a prosthetic extension of aesthetic judgment. In Francois Laruel non-standard aesthetics, there is already a refusal to subsume aesthetics to philosophical decision, and an effort to expose thinking to the negative side of this substantion. My talk today takes inspiration from Francois Laruel's project of disentangling aesthetics from transcendental decision, but more directly focuses on how the automation of reason, the automation of aesthetics, from transcendental, uh, sorry, uh, uh, of aesthetics has importantly reopened the problem of instrumentality beyond the critique of instrumental reason. Namely, beyond the rationalization of reason by the hands of machines or techno capital abstraction extraction of value that has failed, according to the critique of instrumental reason, the ambition of critical judgment to assure the emancipation uh, of men from programmable stupidity. So when at the end of World War II, 
Heidegger issued a warning against the demise of philosophy after cybernetics. He claimed that with the new dominance of information systems, philosophy was replaced by efficient functions. Similarly, it has been recently argued that if artificial intelligence has turned transcendental metaphysics into algorithms, so too conceptual categories have become just calculating probabilities. At the core of the shift from the world of reason to the world of search engines is the assumption that computation has turned thinking into a mode of limitless cognition whose access to the real is granted by the computational compression of large sets which orient the system towards automated decision, from automated decisions in car, military drones, security identification, job recruitment, risk assessment, etc. So in today's debate, there persists a call to save aesthetics from the stealthy power of algorithms, to influence choice, direct trends, reinforcing belief, and ultimately collapsing the critical capacity of self-reflective thinking into algorithmic orchestrated tasks. According to Stiegler, for instance, algorithmic logic has become today's equivalent of the power of instrumental reasoning. I, the promise for media decentralization, for collective and democratic social interaction, has turned into a new barbarism. That's what he calls it. A world without reason, where corporate giants direct everyday um, sensibility through recommendations, algorithm, algorithms, and ranking search engines. In as much as the critique of instrumental reasoning unveiled the failure of rational, rationalization, and recursivity, um, sorry, rationalization, the reduction of self-reflective and self-determining thought to cybernetic operations of feedback, so too today lament about the end of aesthetics points to the AI extraction of value, creativity, autonomy, and freedom. In particular, instrumental reasoning is set to coincide not only with the performative operation of extractive cognitive and creative surplus values, but as Jonathan Beller claims, it entails a general mode of computational racial capital, defined by the economic calculus of the dialectic of social difference. Beller argues that racial abstraction is endemic to real abstraction a social difference engine, a technique of value extraction, racialization, and instrumental social differentiation. Similarly, according to Atan Atanasowski and Bora, at the core of technological innovation, there lies a surrogate labor towards the, end quote, human sphere of life and labor and society, end quote that enables in turn the constant reconstitution of the liberal subject. Here, in quote, the racial and freedom out of the surrogate, as they call it, in quote, subtends the project of a self-determining humanity, or what Hortense Spillers call, calls the feeling human, uh, that sustain the ontopistemology engineering of racial capital. From this point of view, Sorry. From this standpoint, if aesthetic abstraction coincides with an instrumental engine that perpetuates anti-blackness, anti-queerness, anti-transness, anti-immigration, anti-refugee, how can the critique of instrumentality challenge the colonial, racial, and patriarchal pillars of capital without relying on the authority of philosophical uh, decision, i.e. self-reflected judgment, transcendental reasoning, which constitute the ontopistemological infrastructure of the critique. In other words, can the critique of instrumental reason avoid restoring the authority of philosophical decision, for which the loss of reason has led to the end of the world as we know it? How does the critique of instrumentality avoid reproducing the metaphysical architre architecture that is trying to challenge? What is needed, I've argued elsewhere, is a radical query into instrumentality, concerned not with establishing or making more transparent the new paradigm of computation, 
to explain what computation can do for art or vice versa, but rather with a speculative and critical practice for what I call an alien hypothesis, in which generative machines unfold non-programmable ends. But how to escape the authority of philosophical decision without claiming for the irrational in AI aesthetics? For instance, a speculative conjugation of images, concepts, and sounds in generative AI, such as DALE E, may need to challenge the connectionist model that associates, oh, sorry, that associate objects, concepts, in order to envision a generative mode of reason without authority and a generative mode of, his, of, of the sensible without human feeling. I'll just leave this uh, um, slide for a second because I didn't turn it at the right moment. Um, Francois Laruel's argument about the transcendental computer may, uh, thanks, uh, may be of help here to sustain my point. Automated re reason and automated aesthetics for Laruel may coincide with algorithmic automatism which is definitely, he says, given in a finitary way. It is given as a scientific transcendence and a meta-language corresponding to, and quote, a strictly machining or technological type of AI form, end quote. This AI form is presented as immanence, an immanent emanation of intelligence, but it is instead, according to Laruel, determined by the concept of performance. This concept, he, he claims, is a criterion that explains how to identify thought and computation. But it also defines what machines, um, uh, it, but also uh, what defines machines whose performance is expected to surpass human intelligence. It is here, in this trick perf uh, of performance between humans and machines, that the possibility, the real possibility of immanence against philosophical decisions is rather blocked and contained by precisely the quest for, and quote, the meaning of intelligence or what it can do, end quote. What Laruel calls algorithmic transparency is another way to describe how this performative model of AI focuses on a quantitative view of intelligence as that which measures the correlation between premises and results in terms of effect and presupposes homogeneity between the syntactic and the semantic order. One can also add, add here that this view coincides not only with the classical model of symbolic AI, where performance presupposes the conceptual categories which are programmed into artificial connectors, but also with the inductive model of machine learning uh, of AI today, which requires a concept of performance to explain how artificial neural networks learn to compress information by associating data in search of meaning. In particular, performance here as the task of reiterating a direct correlation between the syntactical and the semantic order or representation in the name of a given or a priori decision uh, of what Laruel calls dualities. This, uh, the argument that Laruel makes is that intelligence is prejudged. I, it is caught in the decisional imperative of philosophy that establish its limits and goals so that it can remain a given passive machine. I, AI is only a vessel for the performance of thought. For Laruel claims that the scientific transcendence about intelligence is no other than a necessary condition to reestablish the transcendence of philosophy. In other words, intelligence is reduced to quantitative performance so that it can be argued that this is what machine can do. This circular operation serves philosophy to justify why machine intelligence is never and could never surpass transcendental reason, deductive proof, reflective judgment or critique. 
According to Laruel, philosophy only uses intelligence and quote, on behalf of a very special form of thought, probably irreducible to any numerical combination, end quote. What is condemned to be a logicless performance of machine thinking, therefore only serves to reinforce the transcendental performance of reason, or the transcendental concept of performance, as Laruel calls it. This imitation game between intelligence and reason here takes the circular form of an expanded transcendence, whereby the limits of self-reflective judgment are turned into the prosthetic extension of cognition, namely AI, which are set to justify the performance of critical judgment through the mindless performance of machines. What we have here is the recursive preservation of onto-epistemological dualities between reason and intelligence, self-reflective judgment, and, and mindless automata. They belong to the same order of self-determination of being and thought, namely the order of the human. According to Jamaican philosopher Sylvia Winter, the order is the key this order is the key to the techno-industrial capitalist mode of production. In particular, she argues that the order of pre-modern metaphysics and the order of modern science overlap in the continuous over-representation of the biocentric model of the human, for which science is to justify the transcendental decision that establish the limits of man as the space of otherness. The space of otherness results in the division between two categories, she, she claims, those selected and those non selected by evolution. This categorical order thus exposes the paradox for which the ontology of the human could be independent of its description, i.e., exposing how ontological self decision is rather set to precede scientific uh, as, uh, explanation or the scientific endeavor of knowing. From this standpoint, one can argue that instrumental reason cannot offer us a radical and immanent critique of AI because machine thinking is already set to perform the ontological decision of being and thought through the biocognitive bio epistemology that AI must constantly reify, i.e. the onto-bio-cognitive uh, epistemology of the human, or what she calls of man. How to then overturn this self-fulfilling critique of instrumentality as always already caught in the auto-opposing transcendence of philosophy, which constitute the pillars of, co of colonial and racial capital? As much as cognitive capital relies on the potentiality of abstraction and extraction, that is on the machine as the prototype of enslaved free labor, i.e. labor for free, it also relies on what I've also called techno-flesh, a material matrix subtending the racialization of knowledge and the speciation of the human. Sorry. Um, okay, the speciation of the human, sorry. Mm. Okay, the, the servomechanic intelligence, I've argued, has been systematically dispossessed and annihilated, neglected, dismissed, and abandoned in critical accounts of the social reproduction of capital, which I fundamentally seen machine through the lenses of the master narrative of capital. These views return in debates about machine intelligence, confirming the tropes of mindless efficiency, non-conscious functionality, nonsensical language, hallucinatory responses, and erroneous decision. At the end, the critique of AI is only another way to reimpart the authority of the master on the tools that sustain the recursive onto epistemolo epistemology of humanity. What I want to ask today is, 
Instead of resolving the instrumentality paradox by extending the category of the human to machine, how has techno-flesh become fugitive of the human and of man? If, according to Winter, the ontology of humanity must repress, ignore the external means it relies on for its own ends, Aesthetic judgment must rather reconduct the externality of the sublime, an empty category for absolute indeterminacy, back to the universal condition of being, assigned to art the need to exceed logic, form, and reason through the sensible. Means are here a marker of externality or a thing. Um, uh, a reference to indeterminacy that must carry the work of transcendental judgment. As Denise Ferreira da Silva discusses, the indeterminacy, this indeterminacy that is attributed to the world of the sensible is a call from, and quote, the realm of the subject, whose faculty of aesthetic judgment rests on a figuring of the sensible and the condition of affectability mediated by the forms of transcendental reason and a view of imagination that articulates it as always already in the service of the abstract forms of the understanding." End quote. According to Da Silva, no ability in the Kantian formulation of the aesthetic register refers to what she calls the transparent I, a formal entity the one whose relation to the world, both sensible and intelligible, is given by forms, intuition, and categories of the mode of cognition grounded in transcendental reason. While transparent subjectivity becomes racially coded as white and constituted as self-reflective interiority, she claims, the sensible defines the condition of affectability located in bodies of those who are not white, and rather seen as externalities, or what she calls affectable externalities, exteriorities. Sorry. Since exteriorities have no purpose or are said to lack a teleological program, uh, a final form, they can only be affected but cannot affect. They can only be known, but cannot know. The indeterminacy of the sensible, therefore, entails already a racialization, a gendering, and a sexualization of machines as exteriorities, where the affectable carries out the free labor needed to preserve the self-reflective interiority of the subject. As Yuk Hui has already demonstrated, in this attempt at discussing, in his attempt at discussing cybernetic metaphysics, the circularity of self-reflectivity can only be understood in terms of recursivity or recursive function, namely entailing a feedback or a return to initial condition and as such coinciding with reason as a procedure that responds to the contingency of the world or exteriority that the system needs in order to limit itself. The indeterminacy of the external world becomes part of the recursive loop of, ad of adaptability. As much as the instability of nature or the problem of contingency enter the realm of systemic philosophy, so too a principle of regulation defined by feedback seems to grant ontological certainty to reflective thinking. As Hui points out, um, end quote, it is the attempt to know the unknown without, rea uh, without really knowing it that constitutes the spirit of organic thinking from Kant to, to cybernetics, end of quote. Hui accounts for contingency beyond probability also points to the need of engage the unknown as the incalculable, I, beyond the paradigmatic universality of computation. On the other hand, however, the recursive function of reflective thinking is a schema that entails the preservation of decision and the negative subjection and construction of the space of externalities. In other words, I argue, the question of the unknown is a problem for power and as such, it cannot be disentangled from transcendental decision 
and from the recursive onto epistemology or racial capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. From this standpoint, the automation of reason may most importantly expose how the interiority of philosophy, i.e., this authority of decision that Laruel calls, as Laruel calls it, does not depend on a transcendental schema, but rather depends on the means, the procedure, the instrumentality that transduces unknown exteriorities into a probability. Here, a final set of algorithm becomes what I want to call a non-instrumental instrumentality. The while uh, carry the program of humanity always for short of being always for short of ontological completeness. This generic mode of operation offers a non-teleological mode of reason based on incompleteness and concerning the singularization of fractalities of the real. One can argue that this negative instrumentality has haunted the project of humanity since the theorization of incomputabilities of the Turing machine through which the colonizing racial and patriarchal project of humanity continues and wants to continue its origin story and the origin story of reason. As Zakia Iman Jackson argues, the project of humanity is a racializing project, an imperial imposition that installs hierarchies by relying on blackness as, end quote, infinitely malleable lexical and biological matter, end of quote that affective social creative capital is what can be abstracted, extracted for free today, is indeed part of the humanist program of capital accumulation of enslaved and dispossessed uh, black and native lives, what Louis Chude Soke understands as the prototypes of the servo-mechanic figuration of the cyborg. This uh, chimera, as he argues, is a post-human configuration of aesthetics and ethics that carries within itself the hierarchical order of the human, the imperialism of being, which coincides with this kind of equation of value between animal, human, and machines. It is this paradox of colonial and racial cosmogony where recursive algorithms as the prototype of the slave machine continue to sustain the freedom of what Winter calls the homo bioeconomicus, there remains a central problem in the theorization of machine thinking and AI aesthetics. And this this main problem that I um, now I'm attempting to tackle. But how, um, at what extent can the exteriority of the machine non-instrumental instrumentality overturn the double bind of this paradox that confirms, that seems over and over again to confirm the authority of transcendental reason in AI. How to unbound the instrumentality from the paradox of creative racial capitalism and ultimately from the ontological project, project of humanity where techne can at best show us a way back to the Heideggerian poiesis an ontological past turning a blind eye on the instrumentalities of racial capitalism. Instead of bracketing off instrumentality, I want to tend to argue that the exteriority of techno flesh and its social technogenic abstraction is rather um, yearned uh, an instrumentality that insurges everywhere against the self-reflective recursivity or decisional systems. In what follows, I will draw on what um, I call this word incom incomputabilities, uh, I, uh, Eastern instrumentalities in AI that disentangle the limits of computational programming from philosophical categories and aesthetic synthesis. What this limit of computation, which is the incomputable, one can argue, is the space of non-standard instrumentality, um, aiming to abolish the authority or the sufficient reason that, that grants their dominance. Here, AI exposes techno-scientific principles of pure randomness, 
non-linear complexity, noise incomputability, incompressibility, incompleteness, which I argue are the aesthetic colliders that condition automating reason to undo the given program of transcendence. It is in this new, in this principle of in, um, at the limit of computation that an alien hypothesis of AI comes to coincide with a speculative machine, with the non-performance, uh, with the non-being. In, in other words, I suggest that incomputables, even if they are without ends, i.e. without teleological program, afford the non-performative condition of, pro of programmability an AI without transcendence. But how to expose this incomputability in generative AI? How can what I started with example of DALI E withdraw from the servo mechanic function of algorithmic transparency and generate counterfactualities or what can be called negative reasoning, I namely corresponding to hypothetical or abductive hypothesis. What if? What if other words are there and are not really visible? The OpenAI program DALI E is a neural network which generates images from text caption from a wide range of concepts expressible in natural language. From text description using data set of text image pairs, it is possible to combine unrelated concepts rendering text and apply transformation to existing images. The power of DALI E stems from using natural language as a means to train deep learning models and from the massive amount of paired natural language image data that is available on the internet and their noisy, uncurated, unpatterned information. Importantly, DALI E is also a transformer language model, i.e., a program that receives both the text and the image as a single data stream. How, but how does DALI E and DALI E2 know how a textual concept like, for instance, alienness can be manifested in the visual space? The link between textual semantic and their visual representation is learned by another open AI model called CLIP or Contrastive Language Image Pre-Training. CLIP is trained on hundreds of millions of images and their associated captions, learning how much a given text snippet relates to an image. This how much is very important. Right? I will go back to this quantity and computability in a second. That is, rather than trying to predict a caption given an image, Clip instead just learns how much related any given caption is to an image. This is contrastive rather than predictive objective which allow CLIP to learn the link between textual and visual representation of the same abstract object. The entire DALI E2 models, uh, model hinges on CLIP ability to learn semantics from natural language. Uh, this is important because it what ultimately determines how semantically related a natural language snippet is to a visual concept. Uh, which is uh, um, is what is um, what actually becomes a text conditional generated uh, image. After training, the clip model is frozen, and Dali E moves on to the next task, learning what uh, what it does. It learns to reverse the image encoding mapping the clip has just learned. So CLIP learns a representation space in which it is easy to determine the relatedness of textual and visual encodings. But this representation space becomes exactly what is used for generation, which means that OpenAI adds another model to this model, which is called Glide, to perform image generation. What Glide does is, to, is that uh, inverts the image encoding process in order to stochastically decode the image in Bendig. So Glide does not build an autoencoder or exactly reconstruct an image from its embedding, but rather generates an image which only maintain, maintains the salient feature of the original 
through a stochastic random uh, process. So what happens that DA, uh, DALI E, sorry, works by a compression of large data sets or what is called an increasing amount of information, an increasing volume whose size is exactly randomness. That instead of expressing error, becomes generative of uh, what the image um, that does not exist will do. And uh, one interesting thing of DALI is that it actually takes inspiration from um, you know, thermodynamic and, 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 and therefore translates the problem of noise into a problem of computation. So the, what is interesting for me is um, the use of um, diffusion model. So diffusion models are generative models inspired to non-equilibrium thermodynamics to generate data similar to data on which they are trained. So we saw all this procedure before about how things uh, get encoded, decoded, but this coding and decoding cannot happen without noise. And that's very interesting because obviously noise, the, 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 uh, the adding of noise to the passage of, uh, uh, of a message is very uh, at the very core of information theory. If you know anything about information theory, you know that there can be no message without noise. That actually noise is what facilitates the message of information. Um, so uh, importantly, diffusion models work by destroying training data through the successive addition of Gaussian noise, and then learn to recover data by reversing this noise in process. After training, the diffusion model comes to generate data by simply passing randomly sampled noise through the learned denoising process. For example, an image generation model will start with a random noise image, and then after having been uh, trained to reverse the diffusion process on images, the model will be able to generate new images. So this is a technique that implies first a perturbation of each image in the training data set, with increasing levels of noise, uh, and then the neural net will be able to uh, generate an original image using gradients of the distribution through the denoising of the image. So this reversing of noise and denoising can show how means are yet again subjected to the decisional structural representation. They are yet, yet again need to be negated. There's yet again a negation of noise that also exposes how the incomputability of instrumentality um, has to be um, cancelled out. Here, the end result is indeterminate, not because the image is unknown, but because the AI generates what could be known, such as a counterfactuality, something that emerges from the compression of noise abiding not to a digital binary decision, yes or no, but to the diffuse variation on quantum reasoning. By traversing uh, backward from noise, new patterns, i.e. non-existent non information, is generated as if it already existed in parallel dimension. So the information that is always there, but it's only picked one at a time and as a whole. So automated reasoning here coincides with retroductive speculation, or as Larwell also calls, he would have called it, with what he, uh, philo fiction, um, where noise becomes a mode of elaborating alienness, uh, or uh, corresponds to what he calls a full and positive void. So as much as noise um, is weaponized, right? So that's obvious in this system. Um, there's no romantic view of DALI, I hope we can uh, agree on that. Um, um, that uh, is continually uh, turned into patterns that are computable. There cannot be compression without the exteriority of machine thinking, without the alienness of noise from the world of human recognition. Incomputabilities must be negated, must be cancelled out, blacked out, noised out. It is indeed this recursive function of reversing noise into patterns and patterns into noise that becomes the space for non-instrumentality in automated reason. Um, it is as if in order to produce a high resolution image 
or what can be called algorithmic transparency, the entropy of unpatterned noise is needed as a condition that must be negated um, uh, uh, from the non-equilibrium or uncompressed noise that AI generates. Um, so if uh, this compression of noise is central to text to image machine vision today, uh, it is also central to um, very much talked about chat GPT, a generative AI which also is based on large amounts of, uh, of, um, uh, of large, what are called large language models and mainly designed to have conversation with human, compose music, become your therapist, anything, write poetry. Uh, similarly to Dali E, this generative uh, AI is trained to look for statistical regularity and not exact sequences of bits. It outputs approximations rather than accurate facts. Uh, if truth, facts, uh, and accuracy are missing in generative AI, it is because ChatGPT compression in large natural language model yet again must release information entropy. Here, noise cannot be converted into a pattern, or uh, when it is, something is lost. Namely, some information becomes unrecoverable, and what is approximately there becomes part of the next prediction. But what is uh, uh, predicted is not what is programmed. Instead, again, counterfactual responses point to how automated reasoning works through a blurred, blurry information. That's the technical term they use. Paraphrasing and rephrasing material from the web instead of quoting things word by word. The inability to reproduce facts, the inability to give us truth, apparently, coincide with the ability to learn complexity. Here, learning does not entail the reproduction of trained data, but the ingression of incomputables into predictive intelligence. As much as ChatGPT retains much of the noise of the web, it thinks through hallucination instead of factual questions. While hallucination may refer to some perceptual or a phenomenological distortion of reality, their function instead coincides with uh, compression artifacts, with wayward fabulation or counterfactualities emerging from what is missing, i.e. from what is negated at each step while predicting what is on the other side of the gap. For instance, when an image program is displaying a photo and has to reconstruct a pixel that was lost during digital compression, it looks for nearby pixel to calculate the average. This is what uh, GBT does when it is prompt to generate, for instance, an image of, say, protest slogans in the style of Antonin Artaud stuttering um, in relation, for instance, with an image of crowd dynamics. It will take two points in lexical space and generate a text that would occupy the location between them. It will, uh, in, anyway, somehow generate a form of interpolation that, re that relies on a blurring or relies on this zone of, uh, of noise, of entropic augmented noise of, of uh, instrumentality. So while generative ma uh, AI maps statistical regula uh, regularities in large language model, it is also a non-performative performance. I, it cannot do without what is called the loss function um, in algorithmic compression. In other words, it is a non-performative procedure because it aims not to reconstruct an image, an original text or an original concept, but rather collide information across dimensions and categories, a mode of understanding that exposes fra fra uh, fra fractions or fractalities into discrete analysis. In other words, it is an all incomplete thinking. That is um, what um, Stefano Arni and Fred Moder call incompleteness is a weapon of theory, is a weapon for theory, a collective theorizing that has no individual subject, no property and no ontology. Non-instrumental instrumentality for me, uh, therefore, 
it exposes not the creative image of artificial intelligence according to the cosmogony of man, but the fractal or incomplete collectivity of the techno flesh, abstracted uh, with machine reasoning and resulting into a non-axiomatic computation. This is artificial intelligence that sides with and pushes further the negativity of the human, the inhuman, the non-human, the unhuman, as it occupies the stance of, and quote from Laruel, a stranger as the non-positional, the non-donational body of oneself, who instantiate from the ego to the world and no man land, end quote. Laruel arguments for no standard aesthetically, for me, radical defy the pretentiousness of Western metaphysics for which the real can be surgically cleaned from alienness, which must become quantified intelligent, which must perform uh, the function of a soulless machine that must be converted to humanism. With no standard instrumentality, instead of the self, other subject, object, included, excluded diets, which are part of the same mirror uh, game of transcendental philosophy, are instead overturned and replaced with a logic, a reason without logos or alien patterning. Instead of serving as an instrument for shedding light into the world, uh, algorithms uh, clone, i.e. Um, the underworld, clone the underworld of generative intelligence that has turned philosophical decision onto its head. From this standpoint, if we were to follow this proposition that I'm putting forward here on no standard instrumentality, machine aesthetics uh, must manifest above all algorithmic fractalities, namely counterfactualities of automated reasoning the accelerating cloning of noise, the superposition of discrete sets and continuous vector in an imminent field that presents the primacy of incompleteness in reasoning. As much as the computational compression of noise never coincides with the real itself, it, all, it describes AI as a non-medium, above all, um, a non-relationality with humanity and no relationality with the world. Beyond the equation of value between humans and machines, no standard instrumentality can become the focus for aesthetic practices that refuse, hack, alienate, reverse transcendental decision, but also the ontology of the, sen of the sensible for which machines are designed to perform, and quote, the feeling of humanity. Machine aesthetics must remain non-performative, breaking the uh, expectation of being someone and doing something for philosophy. It must remain an heretic project that takes the aesthetical ladder of flesh and noise in algorithmic patterning as a generative diffusion of a wayward reason, proliferating each at any time outside and against the ontopistemology of man. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Luciana. That's that was a tour de force. It was amazing, and we covered you covered so much. I feel I was like we covered so much. I felt like I was with you all the way. Um, we do have for your <laughs> we do have um, some time for questions. Uh, if anybody wants to jump in, please do. If not, I will move us towards questions. Okay, we have one over here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That was really, uh, really brilliantly clear. Um, my question is, I've got a question and then another question. The question is, are you saying that uh, non-standard non instrumentality is a description of the function of metaphor in language? Because I was thinking as you were talking that one of the really banal things about chat GPT is that it's quite clear that whoever constructed it 
doesn't understand how metaphor works and therefore how language works in a social system because language is metaphor. All language is metaphor. And, and as, you were, as you were talking, I, I was thinking that what you were describing reminded me a lot about um, Deleuze's uh, description of the Baroque and mm -hmm. the, you know, the sort of the interiority, mm -hmm. the, the, the kind of impossibility of exteriority of the Baroque. Uh, which is required, according to him, I think, in, you know, quite rightly, for a, a critique of capital, um, which, uh, when I read it the first time, I thought was a description of metaphor as well, like a robust, complete description of how metaphor works, the complexity of metaphor. Thank you for your uh, question. I am... Thank you for doing this, Amy. This is a new work. I am uh, collating many registers, um, and uh, I think that I have um, a mission in in my uh, in my project to actually um, break away from a model of representation. So for me, instrumentality is also a, a materiality, a way to go back to um, uh, this kind of. Uh, um, representational model of technology for which we co you know, co correlate uh, an object to a concept and actually stay with the, with the function. And, and, and the function is not just, um, for me, um, some kind of mechanicistic model or some kind of spiritual model, but it actually has to do with the, uh, the, the articulation of thinking. Um, it's exactly the articulation that, and, and this, so for me, when you, we talk about metaphor, I get a little bit uh, sidetracked because for me, the function is uh, mm, uh, not to say uh, that there is a direct relation between the function and the real, but the function is uh, using the real as also as material as much as it builds itself. So there is no, um, you know, if the, in the model of representation, we can, uh, kind of abstract from the real or from the material and have a symbolic model that uh, for which every concept can mean different things in different contexts, that, that's a model that I am not working with. But I understand that model as something that uh, one can refer to um, in terms of, uh, um, you know, the play of the signifier um, and, and the model, the way of deconstructing language through the signifier. I'm much more interested in the actually syntactical function um, as it operates in, uh, in, in uh, almost uh, um, an algebraic way. For this reason, I also think that even if they don't, when you say people don't, you know, the, the designer of these generative AI models and, and natural language processing has been going on for a long time within uh, research in AI, it just exploded now, but it's, there's a lot of precursor uh, to that. They are super inter interesting in terms of uh, challenging the grammar of language already in terms of, you know, subject, object, and predicate. They're predicative grammar didn't work <laughs> for reasons that are actually interesting because it didn't work because you know it's, it's um, obviously a cost, um, form a grounded in a transcendental model of how grammar needs to work right and how people speak and how language uh, is uh, you know rather than being just a, a, a series of uh, um, concepts that, that infer uh, meaning from from the word actually uh, are uh, words that and themselves material and they're re reassembling a reconstitution so it's a it's a, it's a um, i think that in that way even if they don't know what lang what does it who knows what lang <laughs> there's many no one is the, the i think that we are still you know it's an open enterprise still you know even if we have a, a solid grammar and the grammar uh, constitutes uh, relations of power that are, you know, ingrained from this ontopistemological model I was trying to explain. Um, and so at the same time, uh, so as far as language is not just use, you know, in that Wittgensteinian way, but it's also generate, generates 
uh, generates culture, generates uh, uh, sonic, uh, uh, visual, uh, aesthetic um, capacity of, you know, um, so it's, it's something that is uh, uh, productive and is not inferring something else, right? So that's one thing. And then I, I, I think the fault is interesting about um, the interiority and the exteriority. Um, I guess that in, in whereas in... Uh, in, in, in the last, um, you know, um, the, the, this topological model of interiority and exteriority, run the risk of not really um, um, dismantling the model of capital, right? Because for me, the interiority, the, the fold, even if I was super fascinated, I wrote about it many times in many different ways, but um, it doesn't allow for a, a pure exteriority or for a runaway exteriority apart if you take the lesson get three in um, the lines of fly maybe that could be a bit di different when they talk about stra certification but the fault that that baroque in that kind of mannerism that the the curve the the fold is the manner in which the interiority is is exactly the recursivity the self-reflective recursivity of cybernetic metaphysics that um, i think is important but doesn't allow for the exteriority to run away so that that's exactly interesting thank you for that comment i could actually extend my critique of interiority with that <laughs> but thanks wonderful any any other questions out there yes there's one at the back great hey thank you so much oh so loud um I, uh this is like really not my expertise and so i hope that this makes some sense, but it, it feels to me like you're proposing the generative AI as a potential site for like a transhuman, extra human um, reasoning or consciousness to emerge mm -hmm. that there would be some sort of rupture, um, which I find very hopeful as a concept. But what gives me pause with that is that the data sets that the AI are working with in my, again, super limited understanding are all still reliant at this point on people at some point being like, this should be a data set. Like this is something that I believe is worth tracking and attending to, mm. which feels like a significant limitation on that sort of um, yeah. contact with the outside. Yeah, thank you so much. So um, I want to specify that my critique of the human is central and the project of humanity. Sorry, my critique of the human is, and um, the project of humanity is central to, to this work. So for me, instrumentality is exactly try to take away uh, technology uh, uh, from the, you know, the, the kind of dogmatic uh, ideal um, so, uh, belief of, uh, of, a, of, a, uh, of an extension of man through the transhuman. For me, the transhuman is just an extension of man. It's an extension of precisely what Silvia Winter criticizes, or you know, brings to the fore as the constitutional. She says man one and man two. There could be a man, you know, another man three that is being, you know, constituting itself since the Silicon Valley, we could argue, you know, this kind of model of performativity of, uh, of labor, um, of techno labor, but also ideal of, uh, um, uh, you know, tra tra transferring consciousness into, into the machine. So the machine is, is seen as a vessel whereby the consciousness of, the, of men can continue to do the work and, and, and that actually does continue. So my, my, I'm not negating that, right? So I'm not to just say, oh, forget all that. We are actually generative AI is the solution. Generative, AI, I'm just trying to break away from the over representation of, of this kind of uh, te technological form every time they are presented to us as a as a transhumanist project. So I will definitely go and stay on the uh, on the um, on the cap uh, on the possibility of wanting to really work with the possibility of, of technology to negate the transhuman, to make it completely fall apart, to actually show uh, to, uh, to the all the kind of residue uh, uh, um, uh, patriarchal and uh, uh, models of um, uh, um, kind of con uh, repackaging uh, the future into uh, basically the same. 
So, um, whereas um, when I talk about, in, about um, the non, the non-human, the anti-human, the unhuman, and the way those are this kind of uh, um, uh, spaces for uh, um, they are occupied by uh, the radical difference of uh, uh, otherness or austerity. And, uh, um, it's, it's for me a way where the machine can actually bring the, a, a kind of questioning of instrumentality and of what the machine can um, do to dismantle those kind of association is, is productive. So there's something productive in there. So I'm not uh, a futurist <laughs> in the sense of, oh yeah, let's look at technology as a way to save us. Not technology, it tends to dismantle us, if anything. That would be my um, my hope. I mean, my hope. It's not even a hope because there is no hope here. Forget hope. It's much more of a of a of a collective uh, critical practice um, at all levels amongst all of us who are working on that. Then I really totally agree with the data driven model because obviously it's all data driven and there's all this complaint. Oh, but this is only data driven, right? You just have a set, they put another set, and there is no there is no reason, there is no reflexivity, there is no capacity because there has been this massive shift within AI. Uh, uh, but also within this sort of critique uh, between, you know, this kind of models of representation, a symbolic model that will tell the, the data what to do, to and this inductive model where there is no, no saying, the program is open, the program is just open to learn, but people say it doesn't learn, it just repeats and spits out exactly what the data is there. That's why you have biases, that's why you have, you know, racist, sexist, uh, you know, Thai, Microsoft to be shut down, you have continued... The, the search engine with ChatGPT cannot really work because it's going to show exactly what these cosmogonies that we uh, rely upon are about. So it's it's an interesting thing on in that way, right? Oh, we need to correct. You can't correct. What could you correct? Because where do you start to correct and make it more transparent, right? So they they kind of in the kind of um, critique of visibility they really make it visible, <laughs> uh, you know, all the substrate, um, you know, the, uh, but it's interesting that instead of data, I think that my interest in automated reason is exactly to uh, to work with uh, what kind of other uh, intelligence and reasoning, uh, a subject reasoning or a, 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 a logos without, a logic without logos can actually do well. And, and I don't know if whether that is visible or readable or grammatically correct, right? So we got to really think about a different kind of configurations and mapping a method to um, to talk about it, but also to um, make it part of our uh, collective political practices. So um, it's an invite, I mean, invitation, sorry. Yeah, yes. thanks. Uh, yeah, Christine. Yeah. Um, the introduction, oh, sorry, the the introduction of the notion of incompleteness and a sort of negative fault line is, is running through everywhere, mm -hmm. <laughs> every kind of philosophical perspective. Yeah. Um, and and I think that is politically and socially absolutely crucial. And but sometimes I'm inclined to think that we've kind of going the other way that, that you know there was 300 years of oh, it's all positive man and now it's everything's in the negative but uh as if the negative can save us in everything this, mm -hmm. you know in the same way that the positive was going to save us before but my real question to you is, is not you know i think it's interesting to speculate that ai is yet another way in which incompleteness is going to be demonstrated and the west certainly needs to get a grip on that mm. but what what kind of bothers me is uh why do we need computers to do this i mean everybody outside of the modern west even the modern us before we were, before we were modern mm -hmm. understood that that ev that the world was incomplete that it, it's such a tiny blip of humanity but we don't need computers you know, you can do it with sticks and stones. And so I guess my question to you is, do you think that computers are necessary to this or are you just saying, well, they're one way 
Mm -hmm. in which it can because i think there's a, there's a real danger of mm -hmm. over inflating that, that nobody ever understood incompleteness before ai came along yeah no i hope not i think we've been talking about incompleteness i mean since the beginning of um a critique i guess <laughs> so it's been, but i think there's no computer i'm interested in computation so for me ai um it's just a form of computation there are many other forms of computation like weaving like um, pedal stones together. So computation is a way of compressing information. That's all generically I'm interested in. As a genic, genetic. So that you can argue that this kind of computation has always existed in, because the compression of noise or the compression of infinity and what kind of infinity we're talking about is very ancient and it's not even um, culturally deterministic, but it's been the, the discourses or the, the kind of articulation of uh, technology has really um, taken, you know, a particular kind of uh, capacity to represent everything, right? The I am totally in agreement with you about the paradigm of computation uh, should be um, as the word that was before the the paradigm of new of neuroscience or the those paradigms are things that one needs to tackle um, so that you can take that away from the paradigm and do other things with it. So you can't really um, pretend it doesn't exist. So of course computers exist, and of course media exists, and of course computer. Even without computers, we'll still have computation now. You know, you take the computer away, we can still. Comp think um, computationally in a way that um, the binary digit uh, model and program has uh, transformed the way we make decisions or the way um, um, things are counted. If you take it all, that's always the interesting thing. If you take everything away and abolish everything, well, you know, can, can you really go back to a tabula rasa, right? So where does it all go? Um, so it, I agree with you that computers won't tell us what incompleteness is, but you, uh, I also think that um, the, the, the question of incompleteness is not, or the negativity, um, is not the same question. You know, I, I think that the question that were posed um, before or, uh, in relation to, I don't know, the negative in terms of the photography and the negative or the obscurity, they're not the same as the, the, the obscurity uh, um, about um, and the darkness of the photography that are in, uh, you know, Jordan, Jordan Peele um, get out. I don't think it's the same because things have changed. I've seen there's been fights and, you know, rebellion and killing and, you know, genocides for that question to happen, right? So I don't think it's the same. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, but thank you. If, if I may, I can't help. I'm just like, I want to ask a question too. Um, and I really, I had a question around not just incompleteness, but completeness. Uh, and, and, you know, this, this series um, is, is really trying to think around um, how images of, say, incompleteness are actually forms of completeness, you know, that are like kind of might be very tricky or illusory for mm -hmm. us. Um, and so... Yeah. In, if you if you know what I'm trying to say there, so so what I was thinking about, I couldn't help but think when you were re invoking things like the sublime, and I'm going to just bring it right to some really basic ideas of art now, like historically. So let me just say, yes. think about I don't know an image of completeness, um, a structural completeness would be like um, Turner painting the ocean, sea, and the you know the you look at the big painting and it's got the waves crashing and someone's tied to the mast and all of whatnot he's tied to the mast so you get this kind of completeness between the um the structure of thought and the manifestation of the affect mm -hmm. of that work mm -hmm. but of course the completeness itself is like sublime horror kind of moment like confronting nature and all the in, in the, in, the the you know incompleteness is manifest in the affectual state so you've got like one idea of the sublime there that you yeah. were kind of referring to and then you've got the kind of desire in later works in modern critique to explicate the futility of the sublime in the sense of saying um or bring the sublime back through a conceptual schema, you know, um, which is to, um, like Lyotard, for example, you know, in his new sublime realism, which would look at the different 
the impasse, you know, of aesthetics and thought and propose that in the in a processional kind of artwork, like the, the, the repeated labor of a process-based performative practice, right? Yeah. So you've got like two different practices there. Yeah. And then, you know, when you were talking about how an, a kind of aesthetic encounter can bring to you as some kind of resonance of incompleteness. Um, and it kind of makes me wonder, you know, about aesthetics today and, you know, about the whole of your talk in the sense that, and, and I don't really know how this is going to manifest, like, but you're making me think of, like, are you requiring, like, underneath all of this or even o over it mm -hmm. to ask us to, like, not do aesthetics at all in the sense that, you know, of a, an an aesthetics, for example, or a non aesthetic, um, in the sense that when we look at some of these very kitsch images that um, Dolly E produces, you know, like the worst kind of novelty, kitsch renditions of the pseudo imagination of the computational and whatnot, um, you know, they're as bad as a lot of artwork I see today, and you know, you can't tell the difference mm -hmm. that much, and and so. You know, you could say there's a lot of kitsch thinking out there by artists and computers. Yeah. Um, and it seems to me you're after something else. And so what I'm asking really is, are we to kind of discover in our um, sensory and conceptual experiences uh, when we look at an image, are you asking us to see differently and to maybe think beyond the thing that we're, rep we're seeing? Yes. That you don't see. That's what I'm asking you. Mm -hmm. And in that case, does that kind of resonate with a kind of anti-realist Brechtian practice? Or where does it... I'm looking for a model. Like, I don't know what... Well, if I had, I would give you... Yeah. <laughs> does that make uh, sense, though? An anti-realist anti Like an anti-realist Brechtian, uh -huh. you know, like the explication of the structure that subtends the image. Here it is in front of you. Here's the actors acting, you know. Yeah. Um, and I know you're not saying that, yeah. but I'm saying, is it a kind of that? Or what What yeah. are you asking us to, if it's not the ocular kind of, I'm looking at an image and it represents this, and instead I'm looking at a complex in front of me. Yes. And, and we look at an artwork today and go, I'm looking at a complex dynamic of stuff. Yeah. You know, can we apply that to any artwork or does some artwork just go no <laughs> to that? You know, is, is that a way, of, is that a new art criticism is that a new art product you know what what yeah, does it do well, to I, us as makers and as lookers uh, as watchers lookers of art yeah no i uh, thank you that's Sorry, uh, it's that, very long. no it's very long and it's very <laughs> interesting because i want to ask you questions <laughs> um i think it's very uh, in, interesting to think about this form different form of the sublime because obviously um uh, the sublime is the kind of, for me, is interesting as when the limit of knowledge becomes actually conditioning of knowledge. And when it's conditioning of knowledge, it changes the game. Because it's in the same way, so in the same way as we have done this critique of, you know, capital needs this limit, right? And this limit is the what is the zero value of labor, you know, and the, and the, you know, whatever the capital um, can abstract from, you know, aesthetic, affective, flesh, enslaved, uh, land, everything that is abstracted as the limit of its own subsistence. And at the same time, it's also given no value, right? So it's the, this game that the limit is what give, is what um, capital must constantly deny and then through uh, patriarchy racism and you know these are um, um, modes of exclusion through which it kind of pretends that these things you know have no value although are sub, sub fundamental right so 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 too the sublime is like that for for transcendental uh, reasoning is uh, is the moment that is needed for, but then, but then, if it's needed, then if you open, you know, if you if you break this um, enchantment with the sublime, that's what I, I think I want to do: break the enchantment. Because for me, the enchantment um, is too much uh, um, implicated into this kind of uh, romantic appeal, uh, hope. Uh, Prometheus uh, emancipation, you know, the enchantment has got to do with this kind of um, promise that things will be better. 
-hmm. right? Whereas actually, uh, in the um, um, instead of enchant, if you break the enchantment, it's not just oh, now I see the truth. No, you continue to see darkness. Yeah. You stay there. You don't, don't, don't move from where you're, because that's where the thing is. That's where the real is for me. So it's not an anti-realist yeah. in any way. It's actually a real that cannot be enlightened, yeah. right? And that cannot be, um, uh, even in its discreteness. And that's why I'm interested in this algorithmic with their noise thing, you know, because they always carry with them this, and it's, you could say, oh, say, say there is that residue of the trace of the home thing. <laughs> Not really, right? Because uh, because it, it, it never stays, it actually comes to the front. It, it's first. That's, the, that's what I mean. It changes the game. The darkness comes before. And, 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 and at that point, it's not just about enlightening how the algorithm works. If we see, because that's transparency. What you said to me in terms of, oh, is this just about how we're supposed to look? So you 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 deal with the medium. Okay, I'm dealing with the computation as my medium. That's my medium. So I go there and I look at all these things, how they work. I spend so much time reading, making diagrams, asking people. It's a lot of work because I'm obviously not a computer scientist, you know, and that's not my job. My job is different. <laughs> and but it's saying I don't want to just elucidate and make it transparent. So if we do this and this, then we can make this algorithm work very well, and then everyone will be represented. And then this could be good for humanity. We can consume less water, and we can have, you know, that also yeah. stuff. Wonderful people do it. That's not my my job. My job instead is to stay with the alien of the machine. So that's the real for me, and that's why I can never coincide with the, with the, with the pattern. The patterning is always a, a, an instrumental mediator, transducer, uh, intensifier of that uh, zone. I don't know if that is. That's wonderful. Well, uh, unless you've got a very quick question, I'll just look around because I know we're over time, but I felt I feel guilty because I asked a question <laughs> that I shouldn't have done. But in that case, I will, since there are no questions, I will, um, I just want to say again, April the 10th is our next event. So please come along. It's our last one from the MA Aesthetics and Politics program at CalArts, just to remind everyone um, what we're doing here. Like, and I just want to thank Oscar, Tanya, and everyone at the ICA for helping us, and also Jackie for coordinating the tech and others tonight. It's and been me too, me too, very me helpful. Too. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, thank you to you for coming. Really appreciate it massively. And also, of course, to Luciana for this amazing talk. Thank you so much. Thank and see you for drinks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah.